Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. I'm really glad and excited that you join us today. Now my name is Nika, I'm your success manager here at Positionly and my goal today is to teach you the 12 essential on-page optimization practices that will help you grow up, uh, grow sorry, in the SERPs. Now if you have any questions, please leave them at the end of this presentation. I'd be really happy to answer them all if we actually have the time uh, for it. However, you can always also uh, email me at nikatpositionally.com. You can also reach our support at support at And uh, I would also like uh, to invite you to follow me on Twitter um, because I'm also on it and I try to post uh, some SEO related content uh, there. Okay, so uh, today we'll take a look at how to optimize the website, main, mainly the on-page optimization aspect of it. Now, the difference between on-page and off-page is going to be visible in the nice, on the nice table uh, on the next slide, but the general idea um, is that on-page is all the content and infrastructure related issues on the website. Off-page, on the other hand, is you know everything done outside of the website, mainly earning links. Now what we'll be focusing on today is metadata links, keywords. So for instance, we'll be talking about title tags, uh, friend friendly URL, uh, keyword optimization, nofollow links, etc. Uh, okay, so let's start uh, with some ranking factors and let's start with the on-page and off-page uh, off optimization, uh, which are crucial, you know, for making your website visible in the SERPs. And, and in general, in order to achieve success in SEO, you need to take into consideration uh, follow, following things. And I'm not sure if you can actually see well this table, but this is a really great representation uh, of SEO success factors. And it's taken straight from search engine land, and the direct link is searchengineland.com slash SEO table. So I, I really recommend you checking this out. Now, what we can see here are SEO ranking factors, both on-page and off-page, divided into categories. And now just remember that we cannot say that one thing, you know, will impact your rankings greatly, uh, but the combination of all just might. So uh, let's look at on-page first. So what we can see here is we have three categories. We have content, we have architecture, and HTML. Now when it comes to content, what is important is the, first of all, it's quality of content. So, you know, always quality over quantity. Uh, also, uh, keyword research, you know, picking the right keywords for your business. So keywords that are relevant and to drive the right traffic. Uh, also, what's really um, important um, ranking factor um, is freshness of content and whether it's updated regularly. And also keep in mind that, you know, uh, maybe creating some vertical content as well, like videos, images, maps, could also benefit uh, your website. When it comes to, uh, you know, site architecture, you know, uh, what we should focus on is crawlability of the website, whether or not our website is mobile friendly, uh, also the friendly URLs that we'll be talking about later on. Um, and for instance, also if we are using or not using cloaking, we definitely shouldn't be using that. So, you know, showing different uh, versions of the website to visitors and crawlers. So definitely uh, no to cloaking. And also uh, when it comes to the third category, HTML, you know, uh, this is about, um, for instance, title tags that will be also covering today, um, title tags with actionable keywords, um, you know, you know, question of whether or not the website is using structured data, so so-called schema, um, and also everything connected to keywords, like you know, keyword if there is keyword stuffing in the, on the website as well. And now, so this was on page that we will actually focus on today, but there's also off page which focuses mainly on earning links. And I also wanted to briefly um, talk about it. So the general rule to follow with off page uh, optimization is focusing first on trust. Uh, so, you know, uh, being, being or becoming an authoritative uh, site, also engaging uh, or increasing en engagement on your site. Um, what's also taken into consideration is how long the website or a domain uh, is um, on the internet. Uh, and two factors that contribute to the rankings when it comes to off-page are also, for instance, if your content is Ad heavy. So if there are a lot of ads, it's not uh, the best, and, and this Google will not consider it uh, as the best uh, solution or as the best result uh, that they want to show up at the top of the SERPs. And then another thing are links. Uh, so you know what is really important are links from trustworthy, respected websites. 
you know, high quality links and of course uh, really penalized or um, is the act of buying links or, you know, exchanging links or just having a lot of spammy links. Um, and also a really interesting, uh, you know, factor when it comes to off-page optimization is your location. Um, and history of searches, and when it comes to social, um, you know, how many people, for instance, share your content is what contributes to your position in, in the SERPs. Okay, so now that we know the basic differentiation between uh, on-page and off-page, let's just uh, dive right into on-page, <laughs> so the topic of, of today's webinar. So first, the things that users see in the SERPs is a title tag. Um, title tag is a clickable element that is displayed as a headline in the search engine results page. So it doesn't appear on the web page itself, you know, but users will still see the title tag at the top of their browsers on the tab. Furthermore, it also provides a title for the page when it is actually added uh, to favorite, so it will be, you know, what's suggested as the name of the bookmark. And although title tag is actually not a ranking factor, but if it's actually done right, you know, it can improve your click-through rate, so it's crucial, you know, that you just keep comparing your title tags uh, with your competitors' title tags. Now, there are some rules when it comes to creating a good title tag, and first thing is um, the character limits, or maybe first what I would say is length, uh, which depends on the size of the chosen font, so keep that in mind. But when it comes to character limits, including spaces, Google gives like 50 to 66 character limits, with Bing it's maximum 65, for Yahoo is 67. Um, you know, if it's too long, the search engines will actually cut it off with an ellipsis mark cut off of the title tag that you're writing. Uh, what's also really important is that, you know, every title tag needs to be custom tailored for your business, industry service, and website content in general. So just make it relevant, logical, you know, clear, and also clickable. And also an interesting fact is that keep in mind that Google search results use proportional Arial font. So for instance, narrow characters like one or I actually would consume less space than wider characters like H or W. And also, you know, capital letters are wider than the lowercase letters, which is really interesting, but it's the fact, so just, you know, keep it in mind. And I also prepared that, you know, a little do's and don'ts list for title tags. So what, what is really uh, advised here is to use verbs, nouns, and symbols uh, here. Uh, for instance, using symbol like a vertical bar to separate the sections. Also, you know, keywords at the beginning um, of the title tag, but avoid uh, keyword stuffing. Uh, also, um, you know, company name at the end of the title tag should be placed, uh, as I said, keywords at the beginning. And also what's really important, important is, um, you know, to not use underscore, underscores and also avoid being cryptic. Just be, you know, descriptive, be clear about what your uh, website is about and, and uh, you'll be fine. So, in general, when the title tag is done, this is a lot of information, I think, for title tag. So, when it is done, you should move on to working on another thing visible for the searches in the SERPs, uh, which is actually meta description. Now, a meta description, you know, you know is a uh, is a type of meta tag used in HTML to describe what the web page is about and it appears as a quick snippet um, on the SERPs right beneath the link. Now um, my idea of a meta description is to look at it as a sales pitch, uh, you know, to make it attractive to link in comparison for instance to, to other results that are uh, there, so just compare yourself to, to your competitors as well. Mm, and yeah, some rules when it comes to meta description is also the length, so the maximum characters is 156, uh, for Yahoo is one, 161 and for Bing is 150. Um, what's also really important is for the meta description to be relevant and specific and to make sure that, you know, each page gets a meta description relevant to that particular uh, page. And of course, as almost with everything in SEO, just include keywords, but remember to uh, omit um, keyword stuffing and just always build things and meta description in this sense as well uh, in the user experience um, in mind. 
Okay, so now uh, the third thing that you can see actually in the SERPs are of course the URL, URLs. So um, beneficial for SEO are URLs which are friendly. So uh, friendly URL is actually, um, this is a ranking factor as I said previously. Uh, so, you know, with friendly URL, a visitor should be able to tell at a glance what a particular website is all about. So if you choose to edit a URL address yourself, you will not only work in favor of the keyword optimization, but you'll also make it easier for a user to actually understand what he or she can find on a particular website. So in a sense, in this way, you will just make a searcher's life a bit easier. So um, things to remember about friendly URLs is, you know, including at least, not at least, but include one primary keyword uh, in the page's URL. Uh, then another rule is using hyphens instead of underscores because when you use underscores to separate words in a URL name, Google will actually read it you know, as a single word. So another thing is a static URL and choose the static instead of dynamic URL. As you can see in the example uh, below, not below, but on the, um, uh, on the presentation, a dynamic URL is illegible for humans. Uh, so uh, if you have, for instance, WordPress, um, you know, when you click the publish button, WordPress will automatically convert it into a static address. However, if you, it will pick random keywords from the blog's title, which is not good. So in terms of SEO, it would be better actually if you edit the URL name yourself, which is actually uh, possible. And also another thing about URLs, just make it, you know, keep your URL addresses brief, descriptive, um, and relevant. Now I see there's a question. Let me just see what's going on, if everything's fine. Uh, okay, so I see there's a first question. So as I said, I'll be happy to answer all the questions at the end of the presentation. So let me just move on and then I'll just get it. But you can all keep asking questions. I'll be just happy to address all those questions um, at the end. Okay, so now uh, speaking of URLs, so let's move uh, to actually redirects. Now we have two main um, types of redirects. This is 301 redirect and 302 redirect. So in general, search engines need to figure out whether to keep the old page or replace it with the one found at the new location. And now if the wrong type of redirect has been set up, search engines may, be, may become actually a bit confused and it can actually result in a loss of traffic, which is definitely not good uh, for our SEO. So in general, let's look at a 301 redirect um, first. So 301 redirect means a page has been permanently uh, moved to a new location. So it can be used, for instance, if your company's name has changed and, for instance, you have to change the name of the domain. Um, and you know, if you're moving a web page or an entire website to a new location, if you change and if you change your domain name, you just want your visitors to be able to find your site and a redirect causes the user's browser to automatically forward the old location to the new one. Now, as I said, 301 is general better for SEO because it actually indexes the new location right away. It doesn't, let's say, remember the old one. So it can actually transfer all those good SEO um, juice, I would say, that you that you already acquired. Um, now, the one thing that may occur is that when a site moves, that can actually trigger the Google aging delay. So usually the site, site then drops out of the search rankings for several months, sometimes even, even for a year. However, it may not necessarily happen. It just, just, I would just advise that if it's possible for the sake of your SEO, you know, it's just best if you don't change your uh, domain location, it can actually appear shady to Google. So they will just wait out. They will be like, oh, I'm not sure what, what this person is doing. Let's wait and see, and then maybe we'll regard it as tr trustworthy uh, with time. So in general, definitely uh, recommend this, recommended for SEO as 301 redirect in comparison to 302 redirect, uh, which is move of a URL, but just a temporary. So you can be, for instance, using 302 redire redirect if you are testing a new design of your website, or for instance, if the old URL is not working, of, or for instance, if you are temporarily pointing your website's visitor to a new URL, while, for instance, you are making some fixes. Uh, so 
as I said, it's best to either do 301 if you have to, uh, or 302 never. Although, what is really, really interesting to me is that I read that Google sp spokespeople have said that, uh, you know, for the sake of producing the best possible results, they will treat 302 redirect as a 301 if they think the webmaster uh, has made an error. Now, I don't know how much of it is true, and I don't know if this would work, and uh, I would just still recommend going with 301 or nothing, uh, because, yeah, we never know. The Google is clever, I'm sure, but I don't know about this, if they can actually check it. Probably they can in a way, but, you know, we, we, never, we never know. Um, okay, so the next ranking factor that I wanted to tell you about um, is the presence of uh, when, it, when, it, when we are talking about URLs, links, etc. So let's talk now about broken links. Now, a broken link is a link that just doesn't work. <laughs> so often it results in an error page. So a broken link appears when the link points to a web page that has been deleted or actually when it's been moved. So, uh, for instance, 404 error, broken images, broken internal links, they all have impact or ranking, on rankings and their presence may, you know, result in bad user exper uh, experience. So, um, you know, you might be asking, like, why it is important to fix a broken link. So, in general, links that are broken will effectively stop search engines from completely indexing your website. So fixing or removing broken links from your website actually allows search engines to, to completely index um, and also tell search engine that your website is not being neglected, that you are doing something on the website, that you are making some changes. And this can be, if this is like, they may in a way consider like, oh, something's going on, there's something fresh on the website, let's go there, let's see it, let's boost the rankings up. So in general, you can find those broken links with the use of, for instance, Google Search Console. If you go to dashboard, then crawl to crawl errors. You can also check in Google Analytics, and there are also loads of free online tools, like, for instance, Dead Link Checker. Uh, and what I also uh, would recommend you is you can find broken images and also broken internal links with the Screaming Frog SEO Spider tool. And once you know you can fix them, and once you fix them, just start monitoring the changes. And actually, the same monitoring changes, uh, sorry, <laughs> the same, not changes, but the same monitoring rule, I would say, uh, applies to nofollow uh, links that you should definitely, definitely um, monitor. Now, in general, all links are followed by default. Now, you may have some links that have the tag rel nofollow um, added, and this nofollow tag actually prevents search engine crawlers from following uh, the link. So you may want to make the link nofollow if, for instance, you do not trust a website which is linking to you. Or, um, you know, the same applies to spammy and paid links, for instance. Uh, it can also sometimes happen that you find the link pointing to your website which is nofollow, and that may mean that the webmaster doesn't want to pass the link just on to you. You know, you can always, and I would really recommend it actually, you know, to reach out and ask him, maybe not why, but if he can just change it, if he can change nofollow to do follow, maybe he has a reason, maybe he made it, I don't know. If you maybe ask him, he may, you know, pass on the link just then. So this is a really important thing to just uh, monitor which are nofollow, which are follow, and um, do accordingly what's what's best for the website. And as I said, if this is something shady, if this is not good for your uh, presence of your website, then make it no follow. But if this is you know a good link, then making this a do follow would be best. Okay, so now we've covered links. Now let's uh, move on to page load speed. And uh, now with page load speed, uh, this is a ranking factor. And just keep in mind that. First of all, faster pages reduce the bounce rate. Faster pages also rank higher in the SERPs in general. And also faster pages improve user experience. So like everything when it comes to page load speed, you know, the shorter it takes for a page to load, the better for you and for, you, um, and for your website. So you can actually test the speed of your home page and main sub pages, both on mobile and on desktop on Google sites uh, for developers. 
Uh, and after running the test, you know, definitely analyze all the errors that came up and, and just, uh, you know, fixing uh, those errors would be great. Also, Google have, like, tutorials on, on how to do this. Um, so what I would definitely recommend, what, what is very often the issue is, you know, uh, reducing, um, you know, finding images over, for instance, 100 kilobytes to reduce. For instance, you can just, in the image search, you can type in site and your domain, um, and then all the images sh should show up. And then with, if you use Screaming Frog SEO Spider tool again, uh, and you pick, there's this section for images, you will see which images uh, have problems or which are too big, etc. What's also really recommend this is, you know, improving server response time and also reducing the amount of redirects. Uh, so redirects in general, as I said, they are not good in general, so it's better if you don't have, if, if, you, if there's a possibility for you not to have a redirect, that would be, uh, that would be great. <laughs> okay, so now that the, you know, image I would say topic appeared. Uh, let's uh, talk about alt attributes of an image tag. So alt attribute, also called an alt text or incorrect, some people incorrectly call it alt tag. This is an obligatory component of an image tag. So it tells what the image is actually about. First of all, to users that are using screen readers, also those people that have disabled images, people who are visually impaired, but also what's, I think, in this situation very important is um, that alt attributes shows the search engine crawlers what the image is about. Uh, so if you have alt attributes, what happens first is that it, you know, increases visibility in image results and also for those, you know, screen people using screen readers, they will also know uh, what's uh, the content uh, about and what you wanted to represent on that particular uh, image. So now the general rules for alt attributes are first of all keep them short uh, but descriptive, so 50 characters limit, uh, also relevant to the image and the content uh, on the website. Um, as simple and easy to understand as they are, that's that's the best. And of course, of course, as always, include keywords, but omit um, keyword stuffing. Now, if you have a lot of images to add attributes to, what I would recommend you is to, if you have like a photographer, if he could just write description to the images instead of naming them in a way that doesn't say anything. For instance, if you have a you know image. I don't know, EMG, IMG, sorry, one, two, three, instead of that, for him to just name it straight away, uh, for instance, if there's an um, image representing red shoes, then he can title it red shoes for women. If it's anything else, then it's just best if he can do it right away. And also, a lot of people are automating the process of, uh, process of inserting alt attribute to the images with the help of their developer. So, you know, if you have a developer, just ask him to write a script that enables it, it shouldn't be uh, very uh, difficult. And also, uh, if you are using a CSM like WordPress, inserting an alt attribute uh, in an image tag is really, really easy. All you have to go, go uh, sorry, all you have to do is after uploading an image, just go to alternative text and insert your description there and this will be in your alt attribute. Okay, so now during this presentation, as you saw, I've been talking a lot about keywords. Uh, so why not say something about an important on-page optimization practice, which is in general keyword optimization. Now the general rule for keyword optimization or keywords in general, as you probably already saw during the whole, as I said, presentation, is that you have to use keywords naturally uh, and omit, of course, keyword stuffing. So just putting them randomly will not make it good for your website. What it should be, it should be natural for the person to read it, then for the crawler, um, and just not do not use those keywords too much. Um, also, when it comes to keyword, they should be placed at the beginning of the article if you are writing an article, for instance, the first sentence and the first paragraph. It could also be, you know, put in the bolded text. It doesn't have to be, but sometimes this practice is used that people just put those keywords in bolded text. And also in the H1, so heading tags and subheadings. So this is 
This is the rule. Okay, so now we have the last three uh, on-page optimization issue, issues I'll cover today, and these are iframes, these are robots text, and sitemap. So let's start with um, with iframes. Uh, so first of all, what is an iframe? Iframe. So an iframe is a micro domain or some type of a sub window that has been inserted into your domain to be viewed there. So now we have a few examples. We can have a video from YouTube, so you know there's a content from a different website put on your website. The same is go with like like button from Facebook. If you have a weather widget, if you have a document in a PDF format, but also what's really important is like you can have, for instance, another web page. Uh, and uh, some people are, are using iframes to put another web page um, on your website. Now, this is not really um, this is not really recommended. As I said, some people are still using iframe, and it's um, this this isn't recommended as the content within the iframe is not always indexed. If you want it to be indexed, then it may, but maybe not. In general, search crawlers are a bit confused uh, about uh, iframes. They're not exactly sure. They may, you know, index some parts of it and then they skip the rest of your content. So it's just not, um, it's just not the best uh, practice. So because it may get, in, but this is also interesting that because it may get indexed, and for instance, you are using content from your different page or in general you may be potentially duplicating the content so in general just make sure that if you do put an iframe and it is another web page just just don't just make it so it's not duplicate content because then you may be uh, penalized from it, uh, for it okay so now iframes check so now robots text so let's talk about robots text. It's another practice for uh, on-page optimization uh, that can that can help you. So what is a robots text? So a robots text is a file that tells search engine robots if there are any pages that they shouldn't crawl. Now, you know people are using robots text. If, robots text, if for instance they don't want their sensitive data to be crawled and indexed, or they, you know, there are maybe images that they don't want to be included in the image search results. If that's the case, then robots text is perfect. You may also want to, for instance, use robots text if your site is not ready yet and you do not want the robot to index it before it's, for instance, you know, fully prepared to be launched. Um, if you are actually wondering where uh, robots test can be found, it's actually placed at the root of your domain. So if you put your domain .com slash robots uh, .text, uh, this should be there. Mm, and what's really, really important, if you, you use WordPress, it should be uh, there. But a really important thing about the file is that if the file is incorrectly formatted, it can actually lead to your website not being shown. Um, in the SERPs, which is really, um, really important. Now, correctly formatted robots text, first of all, it's written with lowercase, it's using UTF-8 encoding, and it's saved in a text editor, uh, therefore it is saved as a text file. Um, if you want to test if your robots text uh, was properly done, um, then you can check it with Google Search Console and I definitely um, recommend you doing this. I also recommend you going into our university section, Position University, when we go more in depth into the robots text. Um, in general, what you can see here, the user agent and this allow, this is information that this user agent, so this particular bot, so for instance it can be like this is for all bots actually. If there's an asterisk, that means it's for all. So all the bots, they can crawl everything. If there's a slash, that means that this robot disallows going into everything that is behind the slash. So in such a way, if you have a robot text, if you go into robot text and you see that after the disallow you have the slash, that means that nothing is indexed. And this may be a problem. This like not that it may be a problem, but this will be a problem if you have this situation and you want it to be you want it to be indexed, but you see that you are not indexed. If that such if this is the case, definitely uh, you know go to the mm, check your 
robots text um, at the root of your domain and see how it looks. But as I said, you can also uh, check uh, this with Google Search Console uh, to just test it. Let me just see because I see there's another question. I'll just make sure that... Okay, now I see there's another question, but we can continue. I will just reply. I thought that maybe there's a problem with my voice, uh, but I think I see there are only questions. Uh, okay, so now um, RoboStack is also great if you want to point the crawler easily to your uh, sitemap, and you can actually see in our example positionally that we are pointing also uh, in the RoboStack, we are pointing to the uh, sitemap, and sitemap, and sitemap actually is the last on-page optimization practice uh, to follow that I uh, that I prepared here. So uh, the sitemap, first of all, it gives your website a clear and concise layout uh, for the for the crawlers. So a sitemap file tells a search engine about the pages of your site by making the pages more, in general, easily accessed by search engine crawlers. Um, they are used uh, to, for instance, also speed up this, uh, you know, the indexing of your site. And in general, uh, what's really great about sitemap, uh, sitemap is that sitemap shows the hierarchy uh, of the pages. So you definitely should organize your pages in a hierarchy. Hierarchical. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure now how to pronounce it. English is not my first language, so I may some, uh, sometimes have problem with um, pronunciation. Uh, but uh, in this format, in general, you should organize your pages in such a um, uh, format to tell the crawlers which pages are just more important uh, than others. So the first page uh, will usually hold the most weight for search engines, and this, uh, this would be typically your home page. And from there, the further the search engines have to crawl, the less weight they will actually apply uh, you know, to those uh, pages. And now what's also important is that setting a high priority to all your pages will definitely not help you get indexed more frequently. As I said before, search engines are really clever and will, you know, they will eventually just even out the priority level uh, you have given for, um, for those pages. Um, what's also about sitemap is that it can quickly tell the search engines how often your site is changed. Uh, and you know, technical aspect is, is that it's built with an HTML file, NTT escaped, and UTF-8 um, encoded. And also, um, as with robots text, we have more information about this on our university positionally uh, page where you can get definitely more in depth uh, into the topic of uh, sitemaps. Um, okay, so now once you go to our research section positionally, uh, you can actually do the on-page optimization check for your site and we'll show you all the all those uh, errors if you have them, if you don't have them. Uh, all you have to do is just type uh, in the URL and we'll show you all the on-page, as I said, optimization errors. That may actually be potentially prevent you from climbing up the SERPs. But apart from this, those were, those were all those 12, um, you know, very essential practices, on-page optimization practices, but I also uh, prepared some hints uh, for e-commerce and for blog, and just maybe let's uh, start with hints from, for blog, for optimizing a blog. Uh, so first of all, um, what's really important is that, that with blog, uh, you have to write for both customers and search engines, and the customers should be your main priority. So do not focus on search engines so heavily, just write for the customers. Also use a lot of re relevant keywords. Uh, make sure to be unique, uh, to make you know the content easy to share, easy to read. As with any type of content, just make sure to update it um, regularly. What's, uh, what's also important when it comes to content and optimizing uh, keywords around this particular content on the blog, uh, you know, optimizing pages for one to two keywords is very important. You can also have the subheadings every, for instance, 200 words. Uh, now, you know, also Google is putting a lot of um, emphasis on longer articles and they promote longer articles. So articles with at least at least 600 characters would, would really benefit um, you in general. 
Um, you know, using in general short sentences so that it's easy to read, as I said, smaller blocks of text so it's so you know people can just skim through it and see you know the relevant information that they that they need, and also just make the content engaging. You know, adding images, as I said, this vertical content, images, videos, podcasts, some games. It also people just like like being engaged in a specific uh, content. Okay, and then lastly, uh, some hints for e-commerce, as I said, and optimizing content around uh, e-commerce. Uh, first of all, is optimizing the title tag, meta descriptions, and headings for the intent keywords. Uh, very important is providing the buy now button with pricing that is visible, that you know it's not hidden in any way. Um, you know, also listing all the benefits that a product has and also giving the customers reviews. Uh, for instance, also re a review when someone is explaining something on a video would be would be really great. Um, and also ability to share this content with the world is, is quite uh, important. Uh, I would also recommend you creating an FAQ section where your customer will be actually able to find more information on a product. Mm, and as with any content, as I said, engaging, engaging, engaging. So videos, games, infographics. We also have actually uh, from positioning, we we um, we did prepare a really great guide on the SEO for e-commerce, and you can find it also in Positional University in the guide section. Um, and I'm I'm sure you will benefit uh, from it if you just dive right into it. Uh, okay, so um, I believe it's all for now. Uh, if you have any questions, as I said, I saw you have. Uh, now is the time uh, to ask those questions. I would also really like to first encourage you, as I said, to visit Positional University uh, when we create lots and lots of educational resources uh, about SEO. As I said, if you have any questions, you can also um, always reach out to our support. And now let's, let's get to questions.